everyone. Welcome to Trailblaze Your Path podcast, previously known as the Parts Girl podcast. I am super excited to be interviewing John and Riker today or tonight. <laughs> you guys, thanks for joining the podcast and, and making time for this. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, and you guys are really busy right now, I think, with kind of redoing culture and working through a lot of things. I've been following your journey for a while. For those who don't know who you guys are, can you share where you work and your title and all that good stuff? Yeah, so I'm John Frazier. I'm the Fixed Operations Director for BMW, Volvo, and CDJR of Louisville, Kentucky. Been here going on six months now, and we're part of a much larger parent company, but I worked for this company back in Georgia some years ago and kind of came here to introduce some new culture, to flip some things around, primarily at our Dodge location. It's a location that has, has struggled for many years. And uh, so that's why Riker's here with me as well, kind of heading up things in the shop. So, Riker. So I'm the shop foreman at Louisville Christ Jeep Dodge Ram. And he actually brought me here all the way from Arizona to come put this place on the map, fix it up, create a culture and make it happen. Yeah. And I heard he, he bribed you with some candy and pulled you in a van. And free tools. And yeah, yeah. He pulled all the strings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, that's, that's something to talk about. You know, it's like when you're living in an area that you, you moved across, like, really far. And I don't know if you're from Arizona or if you grew up. Like, how, was, how hard of a decision or, I mean, can you talk about that, that whole thing? Yeah. When was no, it was tough because... I was born in Arizona, pretty much lived there my whole life, and I was work. I've worked only in Arizona as far as like being a tech foreman, everything. And I kind of liked what John was about, like you know, I liked the culture he was trying to bring, and as far as like his visions on flat rate and his visions on technicians. I mean, paying guys all day at a time, whether it's warranty time, and it took a lot. I mean, it was eighteen hundred miles. We did the trip. Do you have a family? 27 hours straight. Yeah. 27 yeah, so. hours? Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. Yeah, me, me and my buddy Luis, we loaded up the truck, put okay. our, all our toolboxes on the trailer, and from Arizona to Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. Nonstop. Wow. Nonstop. Yeah. Well, That's... fuel stop. Probably. Yeah, we I'm just sure stopped for fuel. Stop and gas and stuff. So, yeah. 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 No yeah. Doubt. Man, that's a drive. The longest I've driven is Oklahoma from Arizona, and that was like 17 hours. So, yeah, (laughs) it's crazy. Yeah, Um, and we and this this just didn't come like like over one like message. Riker and I have been connected on LinkedIn for a few years now, and uh, there have been a couple other times where we wanted to work together, but it it kind of it never really worked out. But uh, Mm -hmm. Kentucky was going to be home for me. I'm just kind of kind of burnt out chasing opportunity and, and, and moving around, you know, I mm-hmm. uh, wanted to get the family plugged in. We bought a house and uh, so we're really dialed in here and Riker knowing that is really looking for a place where he can put to work processes and things that he, that's proven that's, that's worked for him and Luis in the past. And, and he and I share a lot of the same thoughts on process and culture and stuff like that. So having his skill set in the back and leadership there, so that I can focus on the front of the store as has allowed us to really over the past just five weeks now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Feels like a year, but <laughs> yeah. I know that feeling. <laughs> I've able to teach, yeah. create a lot of change really quick. Yeah, I can, I can see that. I want to kind of point out too the fact that you guys developed a relationship or some sort of connection through LinkedIn and how powerful that is and how important it is not because for me as a sales and marketing person linkedin is a a place for me to you know lead gen connect and all that stuff but it's so important for employers or any anyone really just to connect because you just never know how you're going to align with people and the opportunities because that's just what just happened with you guys is right right the reason why everyone should be active on linkedin yeah, definitely. I, I can't stress the importance of networking and just, you know, putting yourself out there in a way, not not like a, hey, look at me, but hey, look what we can do and look at this process and share ideas uh, and network and networking through LinkedIn. I mean, LinkedIn's a great platform for that to happen. And not just Riker, but through the years, I've been active on LinkedIn for probably eight years now. Um, I've just met a, re- a lot of really cool people that whether they helped me in my career 
or it was just somebody to reach out to and ask advice. You know, it's, it's a really great platform. Yeah. I think LinkedIn is just incredibly powerful in that way. And, and so one thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, for your posting or for both of you, if you guys both post, I haven't followed Riker yet because I'm just now meeting. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, it's my first time meeting John, but I've been, it's so weird when you talk about like, I've been following him for a while. It's just, I'm so weird to say. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's kind of. I feel yeah. like I've known John a long time before I actually met him. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. How, there's so many connections I've met and then I meet in person. I'm like, I already know you. It's so crazy. But what is your process for posting and continuous? Because the, the key to, I think, networking on LinkedIn and being active is posting and also, number one, engaging. So sure. how do you stay on top of that, on top of running your crazy job in life? You know, it's stressful. Most of the engagement and posting normally happens as I'm falling asleep at night, you know, and, and, and a lot of times I have to save a post and just get back to it. Um, you can schedule I, them now, which is Yeah, cool. yeah, right. You can. That's, that's a good feature. I, I don't have the luxury of a camera crew following me around and somebody to post all this stuff. And, you know, I think the, the important thing about posting is, is transparency and just being real. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are different on LinkedIn than they are in person. Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay if that works for them. But like for us, you know, we're, we're boots on the ground. We're actually doing it day in, day out. And, and there's, there's just a few, there's a few guys that I know on LinkedIn that genuinely walk the talk, like uh, what they post about, they can actually bring to life and do a work. And I mean, I, I think, how long have you been on LinkedIn? Probably three years. Three years. Okay. So, I mean, he's, you've posted some things, probably yeah. not as like active, yeah. like, yeah. it's exhausting and my it's wife exhausting. like roll her eyes at me all the time. Like, oh my God, you're on LinkedIn again. But, right. you know, my attraction to the industry is it's just something that's so much bigger than myself. And LinkedIn lets me engage with the industry and it lets me put ideas and processes and stuff out there because my goal is to make an impact or maybe I can help somebody through something I post or something I say. Mm-hmm. That, that resonates. And I think what's cool about LinkedIn too, it's not just auto. I mean, once you, you're building your connections and your network, there's probably a lot more auto people in that network. But there's, I, I right. know in mine, I, I see people that aren't technically, or they were in auto or, you know, and that's, that also gives a really good perspective because they'll chime in too, right. the outsiders coming in. <laughs> So, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about going through a culture change and kind of redoing a store because that's a challenge. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, Riker and, and Luis, they didn't get to be with me like from the beginning. And so. And remind me who's Luis, what's Luis's role in this? Because he's not here. So he's. So he's he's also our cameraman back there. You can't see him. But no, you, don't. He, you don't have a camera. For, I'm gullible. You have like I believe that. <laughs> he, he's watching us though. You know. So Luis is one of our technicians as well, and okay. and he and Riker have have essentially come up through the business together, and and much of their achievements and success and experiences they've shared together in shops in Arizona. So. It was only fitting, I think, for Luis yeah. to come with you. And you got to so take your he, like right hand person with you. It's like yeah, only makes yeah, sense. <laughs> so getting so I got, I got into this at on April eighth of this year. Okay. And you know, changing a culture, whether it's technicians or service advisors or parts people, you just got to figure out who's on your team. You know, like like Nick Saban said about football, you just, you got to figure out who's going to be on the bus and who's you, who you don't need on the bus. You get them off the bus and you move on. You get get the right people on the bus, mm -hmm. and and sometimes those people show themselves really quickly, and and other times they don't. They they they're one thing to your face and you know another oh, thing yeah. behind your back. You know, I think Riker would probably say it's, you know, there's a in the back of the shop. There's more of a skill level. Yeah, you got to assess because yeah. you're you're dealing with people's cars. You know. Right. Yeah. Like walking in from like a foreman or technician standpoint, I mean, I walked into a shop that was three weeks out and the skill level wasn't really there and people weren't, they didn't care really, you know, and it was, that's, I mean, that's why he brought us all the way from Arizona to like really flip a culture. Mm -hmm. And it's been crazy because there's people set in their ways and this and that. And just in like these five short weeks, like it's 
already turned it into a family. Like everyone's trying to fix cars together, trying to fix them the right way. They all care now. They're all there on time, leaving when they should. It yeah. sounds so easy when you say it like this. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound easy. But, but I want to hear the bad stuff. Like, what did you guys go through? <laughs> like, well, not the bad stuff, but like, I want to hear I about, <laughs> I mean, was there some really bad stuff to share? Or I just want anyone that's listening to feel like I'm not alone or what's the first two or three things I can look at or kind of how you guys looked at things to help improve the culture you yeah. yeah we got to you have to talk about the bad stuff because when you're changing a culture you're trying to flip around reputation or a group of people that just don't have that level of care that you need to have especially in a customer service sort of business yeah bad stuff's gonna happen and, and so i started with eight technicians when i got there and and that eight technician those eight technicians dwindled down to three technicians wow. and, and of the original eight yeah. and of those three two of those left and some of them left on their own accord okay. uh, some of them i helped them out the door continue their career elsewhere you know on the front side of, and that was with technicians on the front side with advisors again they, they, you know uh, we we work in an industry that's very policy procedure driven and you got to be you got to dot the i's and cross the t's and so i had some front side workers that really struggled with that and lacked empathy for the customer and 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 would judge the customers based on their appearance you know we're uh, where we're at in town you know we've got some really down home good customers and and you just gotta like anyone you gotta treat them like humans and be nice to them and communicate so the hardest part of it all was coming in and knowing that like 98 percent of the people there we're not on my team. Mm. They, they, they might have told me they were, but they had they had other intentions, and they were never going to elevate the level of service to where it needed to be. With Riker, I think a lot of the bad for him was walking into all those things. With some technicians that may not, you know, stay, mm -hmm. but the amount of backlog, the and backlog, that's careless so work. It, we walked into something that was, I mean, the technicians that were there that are no longer there, I mean, they didn't care. There was a shop that didn't care. There was so much backlog of cars that they weren't able to fix. Mm -hmm. And so they just sat and oh. sat and, you know, because the skill level wasn't there, the care wasn't there. And not only that, it was, they would be three weeks out and on just cars that have been there. Like they were, it was two weeks to turn around some of these cars. Wow. Yeah. And it was just, they would leave early. They'd show up late. They oh, skip Fridays. So you guys are dealing with the customers that are pissed about the previous, yeah. like all the other stuff too. Yeah. How has that like, been? Like, like we got there in August and we were pushing out cars from June. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had one truck that actually had just bushes growing in the front grill. <laughs> Yeah, it's sitting there so long. Yeah, and I think too, I would say I, I I do think back to what you said about they didn't care. I think some of there was some care there, but I also think they there was there was lack of care, lack of willingness, but also there was a lack of leadership in the shop, the right kind of leadership because yeah. many of these repairs that Luis and and Riker tackled and and got out of the shop were far above anyone's skill set that was there, and and um, so if so leadership. some of that yeah. Some of that indirect, like, don't care kind of thing was they just couldn't. They just weren't they capable. Do it. They weren't capable. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. so I wanted to ask, too, as far as, like, if a dealer or a GM is listening to this, I mean, how do you how do you get, like, is this a question I can ask? I don't even know. How do you let it get to this point? Like, you know, how does it, it's just, you know. It's yeah. Not, you know, it's, it's tough to say, you know, the group that we've worked for has a, a lot of stores and, and they have a lot of very high performing stores, especially in Chrysler, you know, but th this store, it seemed to always struggle. And, and I don't think it's like intentional from a dealer or a GM level, no. you know, they genuinely hire these people and they trust management. They trust leadership to go in and do the right thing. And, and at their level, they're not able to inspect or, or see what's going on. They just have to trust what they're being told. And so, yeah. you know, when I came into it a weekend, man, I just uncovered so many 
accounting and paperwork and documentation nightmares and my dealer was like wow how did you know how did this go and notice i mean he was just really really blown away by it and and so i would say to any gm or service director or uh, anyone that's facing like changing culture you just you have to be okay with knowing it's going to get really uncomfortable and hard for a while before Riker and Luis got here I, I was I was dispatching the work into the shop and I had a stack man I had I was carrying over 90 plus cars every day of work that wasn't done and I've just felt this impending doom every day of like man I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to help these customers I'm going to have to call these people and say come get your vehicle I can't help you and because we were so shorthanded and the people that I had couldn't fix much of the stuff we had and it, they were just overwhelmed mm -hmm. and and it was really uncomfortable there was I won't lie like like beginning of August end of July I was like what did I do how did I why why did I come here for this this eating and um but you just have to stick it out you know yeah uh, you might you might not land a Riker and Louise to come in and save the day, but sometimes it's got to get worse before it gets better. That that's a good point. You know, I think that's how you you discover how you can Im improve, and you're going in there and seeing all the you know all the. De so right now, you guys are kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I hope I think because we're we're in September, <laughs> pretty week yeah. down there. Yeah, yeah. we don't think it's. A <laughs> We don't think it's a train anymore uh, before it, it seemed like a train, but yeah. So, you know, we, we now have sort of the reverse issue in, in that the, the shop is now more efficient than it's, it's, it's ever been like, we're really trying to dig up work and, and we just signed up with a marketing agency to, to do some more marketing for us because one thing about well, Louisville we're doing better it, now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, hey, come see us. We're better than our Google reviews might say from <laughs> four months ago. Getting your Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram serviced in Louisville is a bit of a struggle. Um, I, I, I believe that the market has has really struggled in another area. Many of the stores, they're low on technicians. They're, they're also struggling with leadership and good processes and people that truly have a heart for customers. So now our task is convincing Louisville, like, this is the place to come get your car serviced, you know. Yeah. I I feel like I just I just know you I feel like you guys have it all. You have everything kind of lined up. It's just more of that like now it's the time. Like the time it right. takes time to just it doesn't happen overnight, right? Just Right, like, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't broken overnight, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, and now it doesn't fix overnight unfortunately. Was it hard to make that I mean, I think we asked Riker on just making that decision to go 27 hours driving away moving to a new place but for you john was it was it hard to leave what you had because i think from what i remember you had a really great solid operation where you were six months ago or before that i don't know how long it's been but it was yeah back in georgia when i was in georgia with with this same group and that's what led me here to kentucky you know i i kind of if, if anybody's been following me for a little time I sort of took a jump and went to Houston and, and unfortunately it didn't pan out the way you never know what you're getting into. I guess that's really all I'll say, but it didn't, it didn't pan out very well. Yeah. So I came back to this side of the world and uh, it was tough leaving my, leaving my dealer in, in Georgia because I walked into that store with many of the same things that Riker and I have encountered here. And, and it took, nine ten months to really start to see some significant change and mm -hmm. you know and then i decided to chase something that 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 appeared to be bigger and i was leaving behind something that had just grown i mean we we took a, a department and and grew it over 350 percent in profitability with the same people and, wow. and and which which is unheard of in the dealership world so yeah it was tough and 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 i'm you know I'm not terribly old, but I'm not getting any younger. So these, you know, 12 and 14 hour days and early days and late days and working six days a week, every week to change something, it's kind of wearing on me. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get this behind yeah. us, you know, and, and, have and so it we run. can sort of, yeah, enjoy it a little more. But right now it's, it's some hard work. It's, it's really hard work. You see these, yeah. 
You lose black circles here. We tired. <laughs> I was like, I'm just so happy and honored that you made the time because if for anyone's listening, it's seven o'clock for me, but it's 10 o'clock for you guys, right? So yeah, yeah. And you're on my podcast talking about all the crap that you're dealing with. <laughs> right. It's like even more of a wake up because you're like, oh, this is really, this has been hard because <laughs> you're talking about <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> right. Well, to change it up a little bit before, you know, we wrap up, I want to talk about just kind of the industry as a whole and what you guys are most excited about and what you're seeing and just kind of things like that, just because a lot of things have shifted and changed in the last, I would say, I don't even know, last five years, two years, every year is so different. Yeah. One being that I feel like dealers and GMs are paying way more close attention to their fixed ops departments, like. Especially sure. parts. I'm like having conversations with dealers about their parts department, which is like never happened before. So yeah. for you guys, what are you most excited about? Um, man. Yeah, you man, can't man, even man, man. think about it because you're dealing with I mean, I think, the trenches. I think the thing, I'm hoping that like my generation of technicians can really change the mindsets of some of these guys. I mean, a lot of the older techs out there, the older foremen, the, the level threes, the ASC cert, whatever you might be, you know, they're, they really talk down on technicians and the industry and flat rate. And, yeah. but there's younger guys that are growing in, they're more hungry, they're excited about it. You know, they like the idea of flat rate. Yeah. And I'm really excited to see that to start growing again as these older guys kind of get out of the, out of the business. I mean, you so many times apprentices and level one guys walk into a shop and they say, oh, get out while you can, blah, 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 yeah. flat rates Oh, that's so negative, yeah. And yeah. It's, I mean, it's kids that are coming out of like college or the little programs and they're excited and- And, and then you get some, you know, 30 right. year foreman right. that's like, get out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like I talked to a kid today, he's fresh out of cap and he just has such a bad look at the industry already just because it's older techs that are just grumpy and don't want to work, but they want all the hours handed to them. And yeah. I'm hoping that like my generation, the guys younger, a little older than me can really like turn it around and show these kids that we're doing honest work. We're helping people and, and you can make some good money doing it. Light yeah. rate is not broken. It's not bad. Yeah. And I feel like that's something we need to talk about. Like the, the whole the industry and flat rate and all the issues that come in, into that i don't know if we have yeah. enough time but i do want to you know your guys's perspective and why it's so broken and it's yeah you don't have to have the right perspective i just want to hear your perspective on why it, yeah. i'm pro pro flat rate like 100 percent. and and i catch a lot of grief from from guys that you know, the naysayers that are out there that saying it's broken. And I think it's, it all boils down like to anything else. It's just mismanaged. Um, and one of the things I'm most excited about in the, in the industry is, you know, we're really starting to see um, fixed ops as the future of the car business. You know, we've, we've been preaching it for years. Fixed ops is the future sales, sales, the first car service sells the neck. We've been talking about it, but we really haven't put any, 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 effort into making it the forefront of our, of our business and and as we shift to evs and as we shift to you know people that are having to keep their cars well we haven't shifted to that it is just reality now we people are having to keep their cars longer than ever because of the market conditions and interest rates and you know they they can't afford to get into a new one because prices are higher than they've ever been it's really put fixed ops in a in a spot now to make the dealers and the GM say, oh, okay, maybe we should pay a little more attention to this. And, and that's where some of my recruiting and retention and pay plans around flat rate come in is that you have to put focus on the most important part of your business. And that's the shop. It's not, it's not car sales anymore. And that's where a lot of GM and dealers came up through the business. It's all they know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the back of the house. You know, that's what gets the people there. It's what creates the most traffic. And if we don't recognize that uh, technicians are the only employee of a dealership that show up on day one with hundreds of thousands of dollars of tools in a tow truck mm -hmm. or, a, 
or a call haul, car hauler from car hauler. <laughs> Arizona, <laughs> you know, if we don't recognize that fact and, and what they do for our business, there's not a lot of dealers that are going to move into the future of fixed stops and, and the industry. And so paying a technician book time on all warranty repairs, making it easy for them to come work for you, making sure that you provide work for them, making sure that you, you know, if they're leaving a job where they had a vacation already saved up, okay, honor that vacation. You know, if you want them to move and, and relocate their families, help them with that. Mm -hmm. Help speed up their health benefits so they can get back on insurance or whatever the case is. You got to make it easy. We got to remove the obstacles that a lot of technicians have around being a technician. Yeah, that's a great point. Riker, do you have anything to add for in, in that area? Just like how can we make it easier and better for techs in the industry? I mean, Besides I the think, old guys telling you to get out. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, really, I think it comes to like service managers, service writers, really like respecting the techs and respecting them for what they do. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many technicians I know that are there after close, you know, angry at the world, you know, pl putting engines in and out, just trying to get this customer out and, you know, working consistent Saturdays and really just like showing them the respect. Like one thing I really liked about John's pay plan was the the customer pay time for all warranty repairs because that just takes that stress out of it, you know, and I think more dealers are going to have to just start looking into that if they want to keep techs at the dealership level, especially with the how complicated these cars are getting. It's like, yeah. I mean, it's they're intense now, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and really just showing them the respect and keeping them busy and yeah. and valuing yeah. that that knowledge and the the time it right. takes and because understanding like even just diagnosing cars is so it's complicated, tough. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, we, we walked into a shop that was full of techs, but they couldn't diagnose any of the cars. And so when you have the guys that can diagnose the cars, can turn the cars, I mean, you have to take care of them because yeah. as the cars get more and more advanced, it's harder and harder to find those guys. I mean, even from six, seven years ago when I got into the industry, I've seen the cars completely transform. Yeah. And I mean, like, it was, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, now it's like, Everything has twin turbos and you got to pull the, the cab off of everything. And I yeah. mean, so it's like, really, if you want these guys to stay in and learn it, I mean, they're going to have to be treated like, like they matter, you know, like yeah. John said, I mean, they're some of those important people in the dealership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they can really make or break that fixed operations, everything. You know? That are from true. Yeah. And, and not, that, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, sorry. No, go you go, you go. No, and, and not. And not just having those guys that can diagnose and fix cars and churn cars through the shop, but you also get, you got to have those guys, but they, they, you also need to have the guys that are willing to grow the next generation of techs. That's, that, that's, that's where truly the jackpot is for me, not just what Riker and Luis do for our shop, but they like have a heart to grow the new, the, the young guys coming in. We got, yeah. we got Dylan who's never been a technician before, but yeah. having a blast doing it. We've got Aww. Shane and Ashton that are changing yeah. oil, but they're also learning more mechanical things that are beyond, you know, anything they've done before. Like, yeah, so we had a couple of younger guys, like literally one has never even worked at a dealership, right? Yeah. One kid came in to be a lube tech and this was like last week, like, well, they started last week pretty much, okay. you know, and then middle of last week, John had a day at BMW and I was like, these two kids are going to be apprentices. We're going to train them how yeah. to be full on mechanics. One, one kid that's, like I said, he has not even been through a quick lane, a lot of tendon, nothing. He just yeah. finished his first engine this week. Yeah. Oh my Obviously, with the, with the help of Luis, with I mean, he's, yeah. of yeah. course, but like, not even 10 days into the dealership life, he just, he just started his first motor day. Yeah. I and was going to ask, took, yeah, go, go ahead. The kid I took under my wing, he just pulled a cab off a of 3500 Cummins this morning, or yeah, this morning, and that, that's what excites me is like, training people and bringing them up and well, showing yeah. them that it's fun and really you're changing lives yeah yeah you, you give are them chance to do it, you teach them how to do it, i mean you're changing lives you totally yeah. are you're showing someone how to do something and that's how they can grow and do and be more and that's i mean that's what it's about and anything like you have if you know how to do something and right. showing people how to do it is, them. yeah that's all that matters i was gonna say something and i don't remember now because there were so many good questions i had oh i was gonna <laughs> ask <laughs> Well, that was something I was going to ask, Liz. How, how do you get 
you know, text to learn more and do stuff. And you answered that perfectly is like, you literally take them and show them. Literally, <laughs> And, take and them if they have that interest, day. that drive, you, you run right. with it. So, right. Yeah. Like when yeah. I talk to those young guys, it's just like, I, we talk to them, we kind of do like a little interview with them and like, see if they're really interested in it. Cause if they're interested in it, yeah. then we can show them everything that you know. Right. And like, like this, the one of the guys who wanted to be an electrician, he came here just as like a part-time thing. And like, yeah. He had so much fun. He's like, I like this. I can do yeah. this. Yeah. You know, and that's what it's all about. I've heard you, like, you to, yeah. You have to identify these things early on. I mean, I had a guy, Andrew, Andrew. <laughs> like, like yeah, I hired him to be an oil changer, but like three days in, man, he didn't want to change oil. He just really hated it. And so I just had a hard time with him. I said, man, if you don't like it, you'll never be good at it. So why should you stay? You know, if your heart's somewhere else, you want to go do something. And it's no hard feelings, you know. I'd rather yeah. somebody be honest up front instead of a year later. Yeah, that's true. Have you ever experienced text or decent text going over onto the park side? Because I've heard a lot of stories where that that's gone really well because they they understand a lot, and it's really easy to to sh have them switch to the the other side. <laughs> parts. I, I worked with one parts guy, and he was a he was a diesel technician, heavy heavy line technician for five to seven years or so. Mm -hmm. And and he actually hurt his back just on the job. And he became and he became a parts guy and he was a killer. I mean he everyone liked working with him. Like actually I know where he works and I've talked to some of his guys and they, they rely on him like because he just it helps when you kinda know what's breaking and what's wrong. It's just it really helps. You know, because you just have that the other side of it, you know. If you yeah. ever quote something your tech forgets it, that guy will know. You know? Exactly. He's like, wait, don't you need this too? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, are you sure you fixed it? You might need this too. <laughs> um, well, that's that's really cool. I I love that story, and I'm I hope six months from now we I'll see some posts or we can connect, and you guys are like, just it's more of a oiled, well oiled machine, and you're not having to like, you know, work as many hours on. <laughs> Yes, we hope that too. I know. Most you guys are like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Is there anything you wanted to add before we wrap it up? Uh, I think that about covers it. I, 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 my, my big suggestion would be to, because a lot of guys are scared to make those tough decisions. You're, mm -hmm. you're just rather than rocking the boat, you'll just keep it as is. But you yeah. can accept mediocrity in this business. You, you, if you want your dealership to survive. In, in this day and age, you got to be on the spot for the customer. Your shop's got to be tight. Your service drive's got to be tight. But ultimately, you've got to dig in and you need to figure out where the cancer is and get it out. Yes. And, yeah. And that's the number one and thing. And I think yeah. dealerships are really scared. Some leadership is scared because tax are really hard and, and people in general are just really hard. But yeah. it's. Well, I can guarantee you this there's plenty of good technicians out there that are working in a place that they're not really all that happy with at, or with. And if you put something on the table and you provide an environment where they can blossom and be what they want to be and they feel good about it, they'll come work for you. Absolutely. You just, you just as long as you put it out there and you're on LinkedIn or so, you know, right. you sometimes it takes three years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's relationships and that's opportunity. Sometimes it's just a timing yeah. too. Everything has to line up. And it seems like yeah, you're no lined up. You guys just have to get through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you thank guys you. so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me on the Trailblaze Your Path podcast. I hope you're leaving us inspired. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It really helps. Follow me on social media. Check out our YouTube channel for more content. And remember... New episodes drop every other Friday. Keep blazing your own trail and I'll catch up with you next time.